Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. G20 protesters to march against corporate greed. Libya's interim council picks a new prime minister. And Yemeni capital's Tagir Square offers safe space for vendors. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East, begins now. Meanwhile, hundreds of anti-capitalist protesters have spilled onto the southern French city of Nice from nearby countries ahead of a G20 summit in Cannes. Protesters from Germany, Spain and Italy have been arriving in Nice to attend the march against corporate greed. Police have arrested at least three people ahead of the rally on suspicions of being part of what they call the Black Bloc protest movement. Some 2,500 extra police officers have been deployed to Nice to deal with the protest. Cannes will be locked down to keep away protesters during the G20 summit. The anti-Wall Street protests that started in the U.S. city of New York have spread to over 80 countries over the past months. The protesters oppose corporate greed, social inequality and high unemployment. These are live pictures coming in from the, cit the cit city of France called Nice. Now this city is uh, very close to the city of Cannes and that's where a G20 summit is set to be held in days. The pictures that you are seeing here live uh, on the, your television screens are coming in from the protest that has been going on for some hours now in the city of Nice. These are anti-corporate protesters, uh, protests that have been following the example set by the Occupy protests in the US, in Britain and elsewhere. These protests are saying that they're out on the streets of Nice to show their opposition to corporatism. You can see there the police presence in, in the streets of Nice. Hundreds of anti-capitalist protesters have now spilled onto the southern French city of Nice. And we're hearing that they're just not French. They've been coming from nearby countries as well, from Germany and Spain and Italy. You can see there uh, the police officers in action. Up until now, we were hearing that three protesters had been arrested ahead of this protest march and they were said to be rather, sus there had been suspicions of them being part of a, a black bloc protest movement. Uh, no news yet whether there's been any more protests or any instances of clashes taking place. Uh, from what we've been seeing in these live pictures, this protest has been mainly a peaceful one taking place in the streets of the southern French city of Nice ahead of that crucial G20 summit. And of course, that summit coming at very crucial times indeed as the Occupy movement has been gaining momentum around the world with people not just uh, across the US or Britain but across the globe taking part in protests against what they call is corporatism and corporate greed. We're also hearing that the city of Cannes, uh, where the G20 summit is to be held, will be locked down to keep these protesters away during the G20 summit. Now, Occupy protesters in the U.S. city of Oakland are getting ready for a citywide strike on Wednesday to protest social injustices and police brutality. The organizers say they plan to shut down the system that only benefits the society's wealthiest 1%. This Wednesday, November 2nd, the people of Oakland are going to make history once again as we shut down the city in a general strike and mass day of action called for by the General Assembly of Occupy Oakland. The Occupy Oakland movement was sparked by a need to end police attacks on our communities, to defend our schools and libraries against closures, and against this economic system built on colonialism, inequality, and corporate power. Now, the protesters have warned that they will march on big banks and corporations unless they too close for the day. The strike comes in the wake of police's brutal crackdown on protesters last week. Two-time Iraq war veteran Scott Olson was injured in the head after police fired a gas canister at him. Olson remains in hospital, unable to speak due to damage to his brain.
The UN Security Council has called on Libya and its neighbors to pursue and prevent the proliferation of arms looted from Libya stockpiles, warning that the weapons may get into the hands of al-Qaeda or its affiliates. UN Resolution 2017 mentioned man-portable air defense systems by name. The war has ended in Libya, leaving behind thousands of dead and many fighters with tons of arms and munitions still in their possession. That would help. This will accelerate the process of building peace in the region. When people give up their arms, peace follows. Disarm, then peace follows. NATO airstrikes have destroyed much of the weapons, but no one knows precisely how much of it is still in use. Although NATO's operations officially ended yesterday, the alliance expressed a willingness to continue its cooperation with the interim government. NTC. Our assistance, uh, if we can. I offer the NTC our assistance when possible. We must work towards changing Libya from a dictatorship to a democracy. For example, in the area of reforming the armed forces and the security sector, the alliance will help the Libyan authorities upon request. The collection of arms is one of the most notable challenges facing the interim government Prime Minister Abdurrahim Al-Kib. Al-Kib began his reign by stressing the importance of building a state that respects human rights, saying that it will take time. Life is gradually returning to normal in Libya. However, the list of challenges is not short, as the country is coping with unemployment, weak infrastructure and the spread of arms. The war may have ended, but the mission of working hard to rebuild Libya is about to start. The Yemeni capital, Sana'a, witnessed massive demonstrations today with thousands of participants. The demonstrators demanded an escalation of the protest across the country until the downfall of the regime. They also called on the UN Security Council to refer President Ali Abdullah Saleh and those they referred to as the figureheads of the regime to the International Criminal Court for their involvement in the killing of peaceful protesters. In addition, in many cities and provinces, including Shabwa, the city of Damar, and Taiz, the Youths of Change organized protests demanding the prosecution of President Ali Abdullah Saleh for what they consider crimes against civilians. Demonstrators in Taiz repeated chants calling on the International Criminal Court to issue an arrest warrant for President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Protesters also held a funeral procession for three people killed in last week's artillery shelling by pro-President Saleh forces of the residential neighborhood of El Rauda. On the sidelines of the Yemeni revolution, a group of people that might not be directly involved in the revolution is benefiting from its reality and environment. Tagir or Change Square in the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, has created a safe space for young vendors who were not presented with work opportunities. They used to be a daily target for the municipality's soldiers who used to chase them and deny their rights. More details in this report. <laughs> It is the other face of the Yemeni revolution, the freedom of mobile vendors to sell and buy. In Sana'a's Tagir Square, they have found a safe space for their limited commercial activity. The protest site is filled with various kinds of mobile vendors. Here, they found a place removed from the local authorities' harassment. The square has provided them a safe haven and a larger income. Here, they feel genuine belonging to the revolution. Mobile vendors are an easy target for blackmail and constant harassment by the municipality soldiers. Every month, the lives of many vendors are lost and many others are injured by the workers of the municipality that has caused their unabated bloodshed. The word municipality in Yemen is like a nightmare that disrupts the dreams of these modest vendors roaming the streets, cutting off their livelihoods outside the perimeters of the revolution squares. These vendors say their possessions have been confiscated many times and have faced harsh punishment without any justification. These vendors are only guilty of trying to make an honest living. But now the situation in Tagir Square has changed in their favor.
تغير لصالحهم كان معنا عربيات باب شعوب قبل الثورة. We had carts before the revolution and we couldn't even hold on to them for more than 30 minutes. The municipality would come and break the carts, put us in jail or hit us, everything. كل شيء. الأمان والحركة التجارية النشيطة. Safety and commercial activity have attracted mobile vendors across Yemen to the squares of the revolution. They sell everything, ranging from juices and light meals to clothes and power tools. إلى الملابس والأدوات الكهربائية وكل شيء. They sell everything the revolutionaries need as the situation evolves. وتحول الظروف. بالنسبة للعمل على قدر. As far as work, it all depends on the situation and it depends on the needs of the customers who buy our products. الذي يشتري. الكثير من شباب اليمن لم يجدوا من وسيلة. Many Yemeni youths have not found the means to sell and buy on the sidewalks because the government ignores their suffering. As the unemployment rate has reached over 50% of the workforce in Yemen, estimated at 675,000 people, according to the planning ministry. It was announced that an agreement has been reached between Damascus and the Arab League. An official statement will be issued tomorrow in Cairo. Hours before the reconvening of the Arab Ministerial Committee assigned to find a solution to the Syrian crisis at the Arab League's headquarters in Cairo, Syrian television announced that an agreement was reached between Damascus and the Arab delegation over the unrest sweeping the country. An official statement will be issued tomorrow in Cairo. Knowledgeable sources revealed that the Syrian delegation to the Arab Ministerial Committee meeting in Doha submitted a counter-document in response response to the Arab document. The Syrian document calls for ending the media war being waged on Damascus, financing arms, and smuggling across borders. The document also calls for lifting the sanctions against Syria. In return, Syria will implement immediate fundamental reforms. The sources added that Damascus agreed to all articles of the Arab document, except the article pertaining to holding a meeting between the opposition and the regime at the Arab League headquarters in Cairo, as opposed to in Syria. Algerian Foreign Minister Murad Medelsi said they reached an agreement with the Syrians during the Doha meeting. Medelsi said they hoped to ratify the Doha agreement in Cairo. In conjunction, the U.S. said that while it welcomes the international community's efforts to end the violence in Syria, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad must step down. Meanwhile, Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan expressed confidence that the Syrian people will achieve the objectives of the revolution, adding that Syria is experiencing a very difficult time. Erdogan further said that the Syrian regime is using its armed forces to quell its people on a large scale. He stressed that Ankara will not remain silent. He described the victims of the Syrian revolution as martyrs, adding that Assad has lost all legitimacy. Without mentioning them by name, Erdogan criticized Russia and China over their position at the UN Security Council. He said that the Syrian regime has worked jointly with its Turkish counterpart for nearly nine years, but the Syrian regime didn't appreciate the relationship. Erdogan said that the Syrian president continues to oppress his people in Hama, Homs, and Deir Zur, and that Assad inherited this oppression from his father. في الداخل السوري ارتفع عدد القتلى الذين سقطوا برصاص كتائب الأسد. Internally, the number of people killed by the gunfire of Assad's brigades has risen to 13. Meanwhile, security forces carried out a series of raids in several regions, most notably Homs, Dara, the countryside of Hama, and Marat al-Numan. Syrian opposition sources said that the number of people killed at the hands of Assad's brigades in Shabiha since the spark of protests until October 29th reached nearly 4,135, including women and children. The Syrian situation on the ground is becoming more violent. Syrian activists announced that Monday's death toll has risen to 13. Most were killed by the gunfire of Assad's brigades, which carried out a series of raids across various regions, including Homs, Dara, the countryside of Hamma, and Marat al Naman. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said two civilians were killed by the gunfire of security forces on Cairo Street in Homs Khalidiya neighborhood. In addition, another civilian was killed in the Karmashami neighborhood in the city. Also, a resident was killed in the Wa'ar and Baba Amaro neighborhoods by snipers' gunfire.
The observatory said that two civilians died of gunfire wounds sustained in the past two days of protests in Homs. A civilian and an army defector were killed by the gunfire of security forces in Hama province. A French news agency reported that a civilian was killed by gunfire in Harasta in the countryside of Damascus during the security forces raids in the city and that dozens of people were also detained. Syrian opposition sources said the number of people killed at the hands of Assad's brigades and Shabiha from the spark of protests until October 29th has reached nearly 4,135, including women and children. Syria also witnessed nighttime protests, especially in the city of Homs, Baba Amro, Baba Mahoud, and Deir Azur, demanding the departure of President Bashar al-Assad. أعلنت مصادر في حركة حماس أن قوات الاحتلال الإسرائيلي حماس sources confirmed that Israeli occupation forces arrested one of their leaders, Hassan Youssef, in the West Bank city of Ramallah this morning. The sources added that Israeli troops raided Youssef's home and arrested him along with his son, Awais. Hamas condemned the arrest and warned Tel Aviv against escalation. وحذرت الأبيب من مغبة هذا التصعيد. A relative calm has returned to the Gaza Strip following the success of the Egyptian mediation efforts in brokering a new truce, which Israel has repeatedly violated over the past few days. Meanwhile, Israeli occupation leaders continued issuing threats to carry out attacks on the Gaza Strip. The resistance factions vowed to counter any attack. The Israeli breaches and violations of the cooling-off period with the Palestinians ended in a cautious truce sponsored by Egyptian mediators. However, the occupation leader's threats continue. The Israeli army's mobilization along the borders with Gaza indicates that Israel is planning to escalate its aggression or carry out a wide-scale military operation to topple the Gaza government. The Zionist enemies' threats will not terrorize or frighten us. They will not force us to surrender. The resistance will continue to defend the Palestinian people by all available means. If the Zionist enemy starts any battle, they will not end it. The resistance will. We will impose a new formula to counter this enemy. These Zionist threats are a repeat of past failed experiences. The Zionist enemy shouldn't test Hamas's patience or the might of the resistance. During the latest confrontations, the Islamic Jihad movement used rocket launchers that reached deep into Israel, prompting the occupation leaders to close all schools within the range of the resistance missiles. The resistance is vowing to launch more rocket attacks, which are legitimate acts of self-defense. Any violation will be met by an exceptional response. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis sought refuge in shelters yesterday. This number will reach one, two million, or even more, as the resistance's capabilities have significantly improved. Though it's not a conventional army, the resistance is capable of countering the Zionist enemy. Observers believe that the unfolding developments in the Arab and Muslim world, along with the capability of the resistance, are preventing the Israeli occupation from carrying out its threats, which include the launch of a wide-scale aggression on the Gaza Strip. Though it would love to declare not a single war but multiple wars, Israel will not be able to do so. The status quo in the region and the developments will not allow it to. This is why Israel is carrying out a series of limited escalations as opposed to a wide-scale offensive. It is to divert attention from its internal and external crises. The Gaza Strip will remain a deadly testing ground for Israeli arms. However, the Palestinians said they will respond to any aggression with all available means and demand that Arabs and the international community meet their responsibility of preventing an imminent Israeli aggression on the Gaza Strip. Mustafa Abdel Hadi, Al Alam, Gaza, Palestine.
Speaking at the start of the Knesset winter session yesterday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to continue to act with, quote, force and determination to deal with the threat of tens of thousands of missiles and rockets aimed at Israel by its enemies. Netanyahu said he was proud to be considered a tough negotiator and that any future peace deal must include clearly delineated security arrangements. But, but opposition leader Tsipi Livni mocked the prime minister, saying that Israel is only getting weaker and more isolated under his leadership. She insisted that Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas is a legitimate partner for peace and accused Netanyahu of trying to get rid of him in order to claim that Israel has no one to talk to on the other side. As political posturing reached a high during the Knesset session, IBA's Zeli Wagelanter asked MKs how long they think Netanyahu's government will last. He took 40 members of the Knesset and gave them jobs. The minute he did it, he's got almost 40 people that owe him and they're scared to lose their job. You know, he's got a, he's a minister, he's a deputy minister, never mind the Knesset, as long as they're okay. So it's very difficult. Never in the history there was such a big government. So it's very difficult to say to these people, listen, leave your job. But on the other side, it's like two and a half years. And people start feeling elections and they start feeling changes. So everybody wants to show to his voters that he is uh, uh, protecting the rights and uh, doing the things that they want him to do. So it will be very difficult for the prime minister uh, in these five months to keep all the coalition together like he did until now. Um, but he is a very capable person. So if he did it for two and a half years, maybe he'll do it for the rest of the term. I support the prime minister. And I am making sure that he is staying in the right direction. Minister Barak is trying to influence Prime Minister Netanyahu, taking him to the wrong direction, to uproot Jews from their homes in Judea and Samaria, to sign a wishful peace plan. And I know that as long as the Prime Minister is standing still, is continuing to lead the government according to the Likud values, we will support him. And he has a lot of support. Look today, in Kadima, Mofaz and Tsipi Livni, they're killing one each other. In Labour, you have the fight between Peretz and Yechimovich. In Likud, we have no internal fights. We support the Prime Minister. We want to make sure that he's going with the Likud way, with the Eretz Israel, and making sure that we are not only in power, but also implementing our ideas. Israel must bring down the Hamas government and should stop dealing with the Palestinian Authority. That's the view of Deputy Foreign Minister Dani Ayalon, who told IBA Steve Leibowitz that now is the time for a drastic change in policy. We should not tolerate it even for one second. I don't think any government would have tolerated that. Uh, I can uh, tell you an anecdote if you are interested. Uh, my uh, first meeting with uh, former President Bush, with Prime Minister Sharon, Prime Minister Sharon told the, the president that if the United States had a neighbor that was shooting at it, in one hour there wouldn't, this neighbor wouldn't exist. And Bush uh, replied with one word, why? People asked, what do you mean by why? He said, why one hour? In 10 minutes there wouldn't be uh, such a, a risk. We certainly need to uh, address it in a, in, a, in a way which will not just give answers for days or for weeks, but on a permanent basis. And on a permanent basis, I think it is very legitimate, it is very uh, worthwhile to consider uh, taking down the terror regime of Hamas permanently. And we can do it. The prospect of cooperation between Iraq and Turkey to secure the border has taken a different turn following a decision by the government in Ankara to establish a buffer zone between the two countries. The new security collaboration will restrain the movement of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, along the Iraqi-Turkish border. In light of the intensive security mobilization on the Iraqi-Turkish border, Ankara is giving Baghdad several choices in solving the biggest problem it currently faces. Members of the Kurdistan Workers' Party have established a stronghold in the Kandil Mountains and are launching strikes against Turkey, leading to the destabilization of the area. Terrorism seeks to stand in the way of Turkey's progress. We are waiting for Iraqi support in fighting terrorism and destroying their strongholds in northern Iraq. 
We are making all arrangements, even if a buffer zone needs to be established between Turkey and Iraq. Ankara gave Baghdad three choices. The first is having Iraqi forces prevent the spread of members of the Kurdistan Workers' Party in northern Iraq. The second is joint cooperation between Ankara and Iraq to combat Kurdish separatists. And the third is establishing a buffer zone in the border area. Ankara would make this move to eliminate terrorism in the area. I think that if a buffer zone is established, it will be with Iraq's participation because Turkey shares many interests with Iraq, in addition to the joint border. So I think securing the area will be completed with the cooperation of both countries. Political and economic relations between the two countries have reached an unusual phase in their history. Turkey needs Iraq's support in its war against the Kurdistan Workers' Party. Observers believe Turkish cooperation with the Iraqi government is essential if Turkey intends to win its battle against the members of the Kurdistan Workers' Party. Ipa Gursut, al Rakia, Istanbul. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Wincote Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.